Good evening. My name is Diane Herman, and I'm the Wellbeing Community Liaison for the New Albany Plain Local Schools. Welcome to our community forum, and thank you for your patience as we worked out our technical issues and Dr. Jeffries was able to join us. I'd like to welcome you to our third community wellbeing forum for the school year. Our previous forums have included an introduction and review of the R factor and how it is used in our schools. And our first conversation with Dr. Jeffries on basic principles of racial equity. These can be accessed on the district YouTube channel. In addition to our series surrounding diversity, equity and inclusion with Dr. Jeffries listed here, we will have an additional forum in March on the topic of digital citizenship. Tonight, Dr. Jeffries is joining us right after participating in a forum on fostering deliberative democracy with the OSU community. And we are so appreciate you being here. On the Zoom platform tonight, we also have John Hood, Director of Student Services, Safety and Security, as well as a group of staff, parents and students representing our different school buildings. Similar to our last forum, they will ask questions and dialogue with Dr. Jeffries in a live format following the presentation. We will also be taking questions from the audience who are watching live on our YouTube channel. These questions can be sent to Patrick Galloway at galloway.1 at naples.us. Patrick will ask these questions to Dr. Jeffries here for an immediate answer. Thank you, Patrick, for setting all of this up, dealing with our technical problems and moderating the email. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Hassan Jeffries is an associate professor of history at The Ohio State University, where he teaches courses on the civil rights and black power movement in African-American history. He has received Ohio State's Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching, the university's highest award for teaching, as well as the Ohio State University College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Teacher Award. He is an author, a speaker, and a consultant on several public history projects. He works with school districts on developing anti-racist programming and inclusive curriculum. He also hosts the podcast Teaching Hard History, a production of the Teaching Tolerance Division of the Southern Poverty Law Center, where he gets into the hard history of our country with other scholars and educators. And while this podcast is geared towards educators, it is full of information accessible to those of us who are not teachers. We are so excited to have Dr. Jeffries here with us again and to hear his talk that he's entitled Making Sense of the Moment, Race and Racism in America Today. Dr. Jeffries, welcome back to New Albany Plain Local Schools and our Community Wellbeing Forum. And I can well, stop sharing. Well, thank you so much, Diane. It is, it is great to be here. You know, one of the, the downsides of, of the uh, Zooming in the pandemic world is we don't get to physically share the same space. Uh, but one of the upsides is I was able to make it from the campus of the Ohio State University out to New Albany in 45 seconds. So right. that is, you know, we take, we take, you take the good with the bad. We take the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you so much. It, it, it is great to be uh, back with you all. I have been looking forward to um, this conversation and continuing our conversation from, from the fall. And as events have unfolded in recent days, uh, I have been even more eager and anxious to share some thoughts and ideas uh, with the New Albany Plain Local School community, and also to hear, hear some of your thoughts and feedback as well. Uh, you know, so sitting here, yeah, I try to talk to my kids about this stuff, and the five-year-old is like, Dad, what are you talking about? Like, I, I impeachment again, let's go. It's like, no, no, no. So it's good to have this opportunity to sort of dialogue with everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and we'll take it to about 7.45, so the, yeah, and then leave uh, the balance of our time together for, for questions and answers. Um, and I understand that Patrick um, will be monitoring the, the chat. So if you have questions, uh, please please put them in, in, in there and thoughts and we'll be sure to incorporate that as we move forward. So let me go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, uh, in 1873, I'm a historian, so we gotta deal with a little history before we, as we walk our way up to the present. In 1873, in uh, Colfax, Louisiana, which is about two hours or so uh, northwest of New Orleans, uh, not too far from uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, in 1873, this is the middle of uh, uh, Reconstruction, uh, there was uh, the year before, the fall before, an election, an election in which African-Americans in the Republican Party 
uh, aligned with a handful of whites uh, who were also Republicans, uh, formerly many of whom had, had alliances or allegiances or were members of the Union Army before, uh, won an election. Uh, won an election uh, locally, uh, a close election, you know, 2,400 votes, uh, you know, to 2,000 votes or so, it was real close. Uh, but they essentially took control and maintained control of the county courthouse. At the same time, throughout the state, similar returns, 1873, Republicans won a substantial uh, election. There was a Republican governor uh, in office as, as well. Soon after that election, there began a drumbeat um, questioning the legitimacy of that election based on uh, a belief that African-Americans just did not have a right to vote. Not a legal right that had been established uh, by the 15th Amendment for African-Americans, which had been ratified in 1870. The belief that African-Americans just didn't have a right to vote, uh, rooted in the principles of the uh, Chief Justice Raja Tawney's uh, uh, ruling in a majority opinion in Dred Scott, uh, in which he said in 1857 that African Americans have no rights uh, by which what the white man is bound to respect. This attitude carried over, rooted in white supremacy, this that, that was the justification for slavery, this attitude carried over into emancipation. You don't get to the moment of emancipation and then those who were holding African Americans in bondage are suddenly like, oh, y'all want to be free? Our bad. We apologize. Like that, that conversation never happened. And so in 1863, after you have had several years of African Americans who have had the ballot in their hand and are exercising their constitutional right to vote and want to have a say in the decisions that affect their lives, they wind up confronting or hearing these rumors uh, that a white mob, an organized white mob, uh, a vigilante group uh, patterned after the Ku Klux Klan that had just been formed five years earlier uh, in Tennessee. Uh, the, the Knights of the White Chameleon, they called themselves. It was a racial terror group that they were forming uh, and they were going to march on the county courthouse in Colfax uh, to oust uh, the legitimately duly elected government of, of Colfax, Grant County, I believe, Grant Parish, Louisiana. And so knowing that this was coming, uh, former uh, African-American, African-Americans who were former military who had served in the Union Army, they are, they weapon up. Uh, they exercise their Second Amendment right and they head down to the county courthouse and they stand in defense of the government. They say we are going to protect those uh, who are duly elected. We are going to try to maintain this democracy in the face of potential racial terror, this vigilante group. Uh, and sure enough, uh, in April of 1873, uh, not long after these African-American soldiers, former soldiers uh, positioned themselves in and outside of the county courthouse, uh, here comes this vigilante group, uh, some 200 plus uh, armed, uh, many of armed white men, many of whom were former Confederates, uh, armed with uh, uh, military grade weapons that they held over from the Civil War uh, as well. In addition to one of the things they had as well was a cannon uh, and they come to the county courthouse uh, and after some brief negotiations in which they say you need to surrender to the, African, to the black men inside, they open fire. There's an exchange of, um, uh, of, of gunfire um, very soon uh, three of the uh, white uh, men are, are killed. A couple, a number of the African-American soldiers are wounded. Uh, the African-Americans who are inside realize that they are both outmanned and outgunned, running out of uh, 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 bullets and the like. And so they say, okay, we're gonna surrender, right? They, 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 they wave the equivalent of the white flag, we're gonna surrender, um, you win this battle. Uh, those soldiers, former soldiers who were trying to protect democracy, um, leave that courthouse. Uh, and when they go outside and they stack their guns in surrender, that white mob, organized militia, massacres all those who weren't wounded and then lynches those who had been wounded inside. In total, as many as 150 
uh, African Americans are massacred that day. Uh, it was a political coup. Uh, the only reason why it doesn't stand uh, is because there is a Republican in the White House, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who sends in federal troops to regain control of the courthouse in Colfax. It was a political coup, 1873. It was not the first, nor was it the last. Uh, in 1898, in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, at the time was North Carolina's largest city, major seaport city. Uh, in 1898, uh, Wilmington was controlled by a similar coalition of African Americans and white Republicans as you had in Colfax uh, in 1873. Uh, and former uh, enslavers, former slaveholders in 1898, former Confederates in 1898, uh, were determined to win back control of Wilmington. Uh, they were like reconstruction no longer. Uh, and after the uh, two days after uh, the local elections in Wilmington, North Carolina's largest city, two days after the local elections in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, in which uh, Republicans, both black and white, majority of whom were black, are duly elected to everything from mayor uh, to sheriff on down. The mob that you see in this picture, a mob of armed white men um, under the uh, justifying their actions of, uh, of, of moving on the, count, on the county government, the city government, uh, justifying those actions by saying uh, that the editor of the local black newspaper, uh, whose building, whose printing press, whose office that you see right here uh, burned and destroyed, they march on his office and say that he was saying inflammatory things uh, about white women and these other things. And actually he was just critiquing lynching. They move on his office. He's not there. Uh, he got word that they were coming, so he leaves, he flees North Carolina, never to return again. They burn his printing press, and then they rampage through the Black community. Uh, some 60 African Americans are killed, at least that's the number that we know. Uh, more than 2,000 or so have to flee the city. These were business owners, these were uh, social leaders, these were church leaders, many of whom never were able to return again. Uh, and they weren't done yet. Uh, they then march on the city hall, the seat of government in Wilmington, North Carolina, and they tell the black and white Republicans there that if they do not leave, if they do not vacate their offices, uh, that they too will be killed. Uh, and fearing for their lives, the Republican office holders then leave uh, office, vacate their offices, and the leaders of the mob, including a former white Democrat uh, Congress person then take over. He, that person then becomes, that former Democratic Congress, Congress person then becomes the mayor of Wilmington. Uh, these, and that was a successful coup. There was no federal troops that came in uh, that disarmed this mob. Uh, that was a successful coup. Those who uh, hold office, who take office, who seize office at the point of the gun are quickly recognized by the government, the state government, which is democratic at the time. Something interesting, I want you to, I wanna keep this picture up there just for a second. Um, thinking about that Wilmington massacre, and we don't have any photographs from Colfax, but thinking about that Wilmington massacre, they just burned this person's business. They, you have half of a mob running through uh, the black community, gonna, scores of black folk are gonna be Hidden. There's nobody in here wearing a mask. They are posing for a picture. These are, these are some of the leading lights of the community, of the white community. There, there, no one here fears repercussions. These were uh, political leaders. These were business people who participated in this. This was a reflection of the will of the white community. This just wasn't a handful of folk who were out of step. This just wasn't some poor whites who were raging uh, because they were the only ones who believed in white supremacy. 
Wilmington wasn't the only place in which you saw political violence. This was something that was very much a part of one of the streams in the American political experience, American political history. But we often don't remember it as such. The Colfax massacre, mind you, 150 African-Americans are, are, are killed, are shot, are murdered, are massacred on the spot after they put their weapons down. In the 1850s during the civil rights movement, um, in 1950s during the civil rights movement, as things began to escalate, this uh, plaque um, was installed at the site of the Colfax massacre. Just want us to read this for a second. One, it's not called the Colfax massacre. It was taught uh, for 75 plus years as the Colfax riot. Uh, as though black folk were actually the ones who were quote unquote rioting. It was the same thing we had in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina and the textbooks that dealt with and that celebrated uh, this coup d'etat. They called it the Wilmington riot, uh, race riot. And it was the blame was put on African-Americans. Well, just read this plaque for a second, Colfax riot. On this site occurred the Colfax riot, not massacre, uh, in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. No word about the massacre, no word about people, what they were fighting for. Like, this event on April 13th, 1873, marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. This was about, they're celebrating uh, this attempted uh, coup d'etat, they're celebrating uh, this attempt to maintain and reassert white supremacy in the South. And the Colfax massacre, the Colfax coup uh, is not successful in the short term, but is successful in the long term. Uh, because within, within four years, by 1877, uh, thanks in part to Ohio's contribution to uh, the United States, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, he goes in and compromises and says, look, if you give me with, with contested electoral ballots in Florida, you give me the recognition of the election, uh, then I will pull any federal troops that remain uh, in places like Louisiana and you can take control. So in the end, that was successful. Political violence in the name of white supremacy won the day and it would hold the day in a state like Louisiana for nearly a century after that. But we don't talk about this. We don't learn about the Colfax riot uh, massacre. We don't learn about the Wilmington massacre. And if we do, and when it was taught in the classroom, uh, it was often taught uh, in ways that we see reflected in this particular um, uh, monument, this particular memorial. Why? Uh, because we don't deal with this type of history in an honest way. What we tend to do uh, is we tend to pretend that it just didn't happen. Uh, we get historical amnesia, right? We're not, we're just the Wilmington, like a coup d'etat happened in the United States. Forsooth, no way that could happen, right? Like, of course, what the heck do you think the civil war was? But an attempted political coup. How do you think we got here in the first place? But a rebellion, the use of political violence in the American revolution against the King of England. And we have a series of these over the course of the post reconstruction, post civil war era that we just don't deal with, right? We wind up with this historical amnesia and that has real world consequences for how we understand the moment, right? What we saw, and I'll talk about this in a little, in, in a little while, what we saw uh, happen in DC a few weeks ago makes a little bit more sense uh, in terms of understanding its place and how something like that could happen if you understand a Colfax and a Wilmington in American history. Right? But we don't, we, 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 we pretend as though it didn't exist. We also sometimes create these false narratives. And this is so critically important when we're talking about race and racism in America, because so much of it is, is built around lies, right? Fictions, historical fictions. And, and this, what we see in Colfax, what we saw in Wilmington, it, it was centered on a false narrative. This idea, one, a belief that black folk were not entitled to participate in the political process, or two, that somehow it was African-Americans uh, who were the aggressors when they were actually the ones who were trying to defend democracy. And so the villains then become the heroes. 
the ones who were committed to destroying the democracy, limiting democracy, making it only available to themselves, are somehow become the ones who become who, who are lionized in history. That's just making stuff up. That's the whole lost cause. The whole lost cause is just fabricating history, right? The whole the, the, the notion of the Confederacy and all this, the power of lies to move and influence people's behavior is dangerous. And those lies in the American context, almost always as they're connected to politics in some way circle back to race and racism. And I'll say more about that in a moment. And the other thing that we wind up doing when we, when we look at these examples, these, these instances of hard history, aspects of our past that make us uncomfortable about the present especially as they revolve around race and racism, is we tend to rationalize it, right? We'll find a way to rationalize it. Here, the rationalization is uh, trying to end carpetbag misrule, right? Uh, black folk uh, who are uh, somehow denying uh, the rights and mistreating white folk. That's trying to rationalize the, uh, the effort, an evil effort, uh, to, to uh, rob African-Americans of their constitutional right to participate in the political process. And again, we do this in the past and we have to be cognizant of it because all it does is perpetuate some myth that is used to justify some action that will cause harm to people. So how does this play out? especially in the context of what we just saw a week ago. Now, we are always, as a historian, uh, you know, I like to tell my students, you are always living history. History happens every day, every moment. As soon as the, the clock uh, hits another second, you've just witnessed history. But not all history is the same. Some historical events rise to a greater level of importance than other historical events. And I would argue that what we just saw is one of those historical events that rises to that different level. I, like many people, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, was um, shocked uh, by the incidents that the violence and the like that occurred one week ago, Wednesday uh, on January 6th. I was shocked, but I was not surprised. I was not surprised not only because I'm familiar with uh, America's long history of political violence and the use of violence to influence politics, but I was also not surprised uh, because this had been building, uh, not just over the last four years in which you have a president uh, who was clearly uh, basing a lot of his uh, uh, policy beliefs and his appeal uh, on disparaging other people and on plain uh, lies, right? And, and, and we see where lies get you in the end. But what's most interesting, and hopefully we can talk about sort of those connections a little bit later on, but what was most interesting to me as somebody who studies and thinks and talks about race and racism is how we talked about it in the moment. Uh, there were, you know, watching the news and, and, and still watching the coverage of it in this moment now, you, you, you see the historical amnesia, right? People say, oh my gosh, how could this happen in America? This never happens in America. Like, what are you talking about? Do we need to talk about the examples in which this has happened in America, right? We like to think that we have this wonderful political tradition of democracy for all. We've been playing around with democracy for the last 50 years, right? I mean, that, if you wanna talk about when we have had uh, the, most, the, the, the fewest barriers to participate in the political process, our democracy is young. Right, black folk essentially couldn't vote before 1965. Women couldn't vote before 1920. Most white men couldn't vote uh, in the early uh, years of the, of the nation. So we have a young democracy. Uh, and that historical amnesia was on play as people began to think and process what it was that we were seeing in this moment. We also began to see uh, immediately people creating false, false narratives, right? What, what were some of those false narratives, right? That it was Antifa. Right. The, in other words, somebody who was not there was responsible for the violence that took place because of the people who were there. Right. Like that's just not true. It just this is that's not a partisan 
uh, point. That's just the reality. Who was in the building and who was not in the building, right? So again, we see how do we deal with the difficulty of what we just saw creating these false narratives? And then we also saw in many of the conversations, people attempting to rationalize this clear evil action in which five people lost their lives, right? An attempt to take over uh, to prevent uh, the uh, electoral process, the government uh, from doing its constitutional duty. And what was one of the ways, and you still hear it echoed uh, in, in, in certain corners of the uh, media universe, uh, the rationalization of this action saying, oh, if it wasn't for the protests that we saw this past summer, Black Lives Matter protests, then this never would have happened. Uh, these folk never would have thought uh, that they could uh, march on uh, the Capitol and invade the Capitol and overtake the Capitol. Uh, I, at, that was the first time uh, I knew or heard that people committed to white supremacy, and we know that these are these white supremacist groups who were a part of that, uh, were taking their cue from black folk, right? Like that, that was new to me. That was an interesting twist uh, in terms of trying to rationalize this particular, this particular action. But as I watched this play out, um, this wasn't just for me something that was academic. Right, just the, the 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 surprise of what the moment was, uh, because my brother is a sitting congressperson. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries represents the the eighth congressional district of New York. That's my older brother. I say he's my older brother, but I I'm the prettier one. The he was in the House chamber, he was on the floor of the House, and he's in the Democratic Party leadership. And I didn't know if he was safe or not. And it was only literally through social media that people are asking me, yeah, hey, how's your, is your brother okay as this stuff is going on? And I'm like, well, I text them, I haven't heard back, I don't know, that finally somebody says, well, I just heard uh, Liz Cheney uh, give a interview uh, with CNN or somebody, and she said that he, she's in a bunker with him. So, so he's alive. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Thank you very much. Uh, but afterward, speaking to him afterward, and he gave a, a interview with uh, the Grio. You can Google it where he talks about this. And he says, you know, we're sitting there in the House chamber, and suddenly the Speaker of the House is whisked away, uh, and then the uh, Minority Leader is whisked away, and then we hear over the loudspeaker that uh, this mob is on the outside, and we could hear them. Uh, and then over the loudspeaker, another announcement is made uh, that the mob has breached the building. Uh, and then another announcement is made a few minutes after that, that the mob is approaching and that everybody uh, should, should take cover. Uh, and then he, he talked about in that moment that he had a decision to make. Uh, him and another elected official who's a former football player. Well, yeah, my brother's a little bit older, but he ain't that much bigger than me. Uh, he said, he said, I got a decision to make. If this is going to go down, it's just going to go down. Right. And, and I'm not going to let a mob uh, take my life without a fight. I mean, that's where this was. That's that's how close this came uh, to being even worse than just having five folk lose their lives. And so when we talk about um, race and racism in American society, the, this isn't something that is just abstract. In a very real way, this is something that impacts people's lives. Whether we're talking about sitting Congress people or we're talking about everyday ordinary African-Americans who find themselves uh, being confronted by the police uh, and then losing their lives. Uh, that's why this is such a critically important subject for us to discuss, even though it is difficult, but it is something that we have to do because the stakes for the society are so high and not just for black folk and brown folk. The democracy is on the brink of crumbling because of a belief in white supremacy. When we think about this notion that was perpetuated and it is a lie, this is not partisan, this is just facts, that this election was somehow stolen the re it was not stolen. It, it was no voter fraud. This is a lie. But what was the lie predicated on? 
it was predicated on a belief that the election was stolen in places where black and brown people vote, right? In Philadelphia, in Detroit, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, out West in Arizona. That gave it credibility. The lie gained credibility among white voters, Trump supporters, because it was rooted in the same belief that led to that Colfax massacre, that somehow black folk are not entitled to participate in the electoral process. This isn't just about black folk. And that's what African-Americans have been trying to convey through the civil rights movement and the black freedom struggle all along. Yeah, we're trying to save our own lives, but we're trying to save your darn lives too. We're trying to save the democracy. That's what the fight has been all about. And we saw that this past summer with the Black Lives Matter protests. The purpose of those protests, why you have some 35 million people took to the streets of America, overwhelmingly white, saying that we need justice for those who are the victims of police violence, that this has to stop. That's what that was about. And in too many of our school districts, too many of our households, that conversation never happened, right? And so we never actually talked about what people were out there fighting for. And so when you don't do that, which is our duty as teachers and educators, when we don't do that as parents, then suddenly people are able to say, fast forward a year, oh, these people who are trying to enact a political coup are just doing the same things as what black all these demonstrators did uh, you know, last summer. That the two are not the same. Black people were trying to save lives. What we saw last week was people trying to take lives. The two are not the same. But African Americans just weren't fighting for taking to the streets, seeking justice. They were also seeking recognition of black humanity. That's why you had these beautiful murals populated all across the country. And this is one from Cincinnati. They were trying to say that literally black lives matter. And the, as we saw, as I sit, sat back and watched what was happening at the Capitol, and I should have been doing work. I was trying to write, right? I'm trying to write about history. And meanwhile, history's taking place in the moment, right? And I had to put my, I felt a little bad, but then I was like, well, I should see if my brother's okay. So I didn't feel too bad. But th this is what people were fighting for. Like, like lives. And I'm, and, 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 you know, I'm on, you know, partly on social media to check out, see if my brother's okay, but I'm also getting text messages and all my friends, right. Are like the same thing, you know, if they were black, they would not have even got up to the second step. Right. I mean, the, the, the response to this terror attack was so fundamentally different. How do we explain it? We explain it because of the way in which we perceive threats in America has been racialized, right? We don't perceive, the police have not perceived in this instance, white, white supremacist groups as being a threat. But black folk saying, try organizing to, to stop killing are somehow a threat. It was rooted in threat perception, that response. And we need to deal with that because that threat perception is what gets black folk killed when an African-American who's unarmed gets pulled over by the police and suddenly, uh, you know, he gets shot here in Columbus, Ohio. Actually, here in Columbus, Ohio, when an African-American emerges from a garage with a cell phone in his hand and gets shot uh, by a city police officer, that's about threat perception. The perception that this person was going to do harm, rooted in race. We have to deal with that. And so what black folk, what people were taking to the streets for was saying that we need to recognize black humanity and stop treating all black folk as threats so we can save additional lives as well. And then finally, black folk, were, people were taken to the streets seeking truth. And this is why those Confederate monuments and these other monuments to white supremacy, uh, folk were saying they got to come down because this is about truth. And somebody's like, ah, you know, why are you complaining about monuments and memorials? And, you know, wh what's the big deal if they stay up, if they stay down? Because if they stay up, they perpetuate the lie. If they stay up, they say that white supremacy has a place in our society, in our public discourse. If they stay up, they allow the Confederate flag, a white supremacist symbol, to be paraded through the Capitol 
uh, when white supremacists uh, march through that building uh, on April 6th. That's the danger of not telling the truth. And that's what we have to do. We literally had people rampage through the nation's capital based on a lie. And we can't have that. And this is what black folk was saying is like, we have to stop lying about the past so we can stop lying about the present. And one of the biggest lies, of course, is white supremacy. Right? When we think about sort of race and racism and what's the intersection, we can't just compartmentalize it and say, this is something that happens over there. And yeah, we got to understand how race and racism plays out. No, right now, the biggest threat to democracy, to American democracy, is the ideology of white supremacy. Those who are trying to make sure that this is a government run and driven by those who believe in white supremacy and want to perpetuate it. And they're challenging uh, the sitting government because the biggest threat to white supremacy is actually democracy. That's the great fear for those who are committed to this ideal is actually democracy. And that's what black folk have been fighting for, to be included in the democracy, to have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. But the biggest lie is this notion of white supremacy because race itself is not real. Like that's the big, that's the biggest lie of them all. This idea that somehow race is real because race is not real. It is biologically meaningless. Race has no biological meaning, period. It means nothing. It was a fiction, it was a fabrication of some folk who used, who were trying to come up with in the enlightenment era, the post enlightenment renaissance era, the early, late 1400s, 1500s, as a way to justify the enslavement of other people. By everything, everybody who's on this, on this call right now, under the skin are essentially the same. There's no scientific, no biological difference. But race is socially meaningful because for the last 500 years, we have used race to create hierarchy in our society, to privilege some and to disadvantage others. So it is socially meaningful. It's a predictor in this, in this even in this world today, for people's outcomes in life. So biologically meaningless, but socially meaningful. And race is also culturally relevant. And this is important as well culturally relevant in the sense that in the American context, we use race as a stand-in for cultural ancestry, for where people come from, for people's heritage. And so it's socially meaningful, it creates hierarchy, but it's culturally relevant because that's how we speak uh, about our past. And because of this, we cannot fall into the colorblind trap. And this is critical. If you remember nothing about Nothing else about what we talk about today. You have to remember that we can't uh, avoid talking about race we, because although it's yet, yeah, it's meaningless scientifically, biologically, but it structures our society and also is culturally relevant, reflects who we are uh, as individuals and people. So when people come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Jeffries, I just want to tell you if a conversation like that, I just want to tell you, I'm very proud that you know, white people come up and say, oh, I just want to tell you I'm colorblind. And I'm like, oh, are you really? That, that's good. You may be the only one in the world. It's like, of course you're not colorblind. And in fact, I don't need you to be because when you are, what you're actually doing is not seeing me because of the cultural relevance. The problem is not seeing people and identifying and recognizing their race. The problem is discriminating against people based upon their race, stereotyping people based upon their race. Don't do that. But by all means, don't erase the history Right? Don't erase my parents' struggle uh, and grandparents' struggle coming up in the Jim Crow era. Don't erase uh, my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents who were enslaved in Virginia and Georgia. If it wasn't for their struggle and survival, I would not be here. That's not a badge of shame. I'm proud of the fact that they were able to survive and endure. So we can't avoid the colorblind trap. We're not going to get out of this mess by pretending uh, that race isn't socially meaningful uh, or disrespecting people by saying that race isn't culturally relevant. But while race isn't real, racism absolutely is real. Absolutely is real. And it manifests, and we talked a little bit about this uh, last fall, it manifests itself in personal ways, prejudicial beliefs and behaviors, and we have to understand that. And that's usually easy to see, but it also manifests itself in these structural ways, prejudice embedded in systems and structures. And we'll say a little bit more about that um, in a few moments.
But where are we going to begin? Where do you begin? Where should we begin when we have these conversations and we're talking about sort of race and racism in American society? If we want to make sense of what we just saw uh, on, on um, uh, January 6th, where do we begin? Do we begin on January 5th? Do we, do we begin uh, on, uh, in, on November uh, 2020 with the election? Do we begin in 2016? No, you have to go all the way back. We have to begin at the beginning. Uh, we have to begin in 1619. We have to begin with the arrival of African-Americans, enslaved African-Africans on the shores of this, what will become uh, the United States in 1619. This is our origin, not just the origin of black folk in America. This is the origin of America. Racism is encoded in our DNA as a nation. It is encoded in our DNA. The twin pillars of this country are racism and capitalism. And the two intertwined from the very beginning gave us slavery. That is the start. We talk about uh, racism being often being America's original sin. It wasn't, it was America's origin. It provided the rationalization and the justification for the exploitation of people through the institution of the economic institution of slavery. We, that's where we begin. Now, look, you don't have to begin every conversation with that. You know, you meet somebody on the plane. Hey, how you doing? Oh, very good. Let's talk about 1690. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But if we're trying to put this into a broader context, this is what we're dealing with. And as we move forward in time and you get to the founding of the nation, and I've done, you know, a TED Talk, some of you may have seen, in which I talk about sort of James Madison. Yeah, you know, here you have the father of the Constitution, the architect of the, Const of the Bill of Rights, <clears throat> and he was an enslaver. He enslaved over 100 people over the course of his lifetime. And this just wasn't, this is why I'm saying that we gotta understand how deeply embedded racism is in the fabric of our society, woven uh, into our DNA, part of that double helix, is that he just wasn't, like, like slavery just wasn't a side hustle for James Madison. Right? And that's that rationalization. That's just something they did on the side. He was a third generation enslaver. Like, like he, he, this, what, this is what he lived and breathed. Now, if he was a third generation, you know, cobbler, we'd be like, oh, James Madison, boy, he was really one heck of a, of a shoeman, right? Like, what, it's the slavery, this is what he did. And so we cannot divorce what he creates, the Bill of Rights, from what he was doing to other people. I mean, this is, this is our starting point. And that image, and, and, and some of you may have seen this before, the image on the right is, 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 is an image of the, of, the, of the foundation of Madison's plantation estate, his building. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see some of those impressions in the brick are the impressions of the children that he enslaved who made the bricks for his home, for the plantation. And what's on the left, the image on the left is his study, Madison's study, where uh, he conceived and conceptualized the Bill of Rights. So this foundational document rests on a prism, uh, rests on a foundation of bricks made by the children he enslaved. And he rationalized and justified that by racism. So this is, this is our starting point, both as in here in North America and British North America, but then also the starting point of the nation itself. But this isn't just a story, this isn't just a story of the negative. Right, racism, absolutely. But it's not just a story of the negative. It's also a story of people fighting back. And here in Ohio, we have a rich history of people fighting back, of African-Americans uh, resisting slavery, of uh, white allies, uh, conductors, uh, helping them along the way. But we can't get so obsessed with this that suddenly we assume that this is everything, this is all we did. Right. And like we can't pretend that Ohio was always on the right side of history because it wasn't. Right. Like, yeah, Ohio in 1803 starts uh, its constitution as a state that is uh, does not allow slavery. But the reason why they didn't allow slavery is because they didn't want black people in the state. Like that's part of that hard history we got to understand. And so to make um, to make even Ohio more democratic, black folk who escaped slavery in Virginia and Kentucky, uh, they had to themselves uh, fight uh, for more freedom and more liberty uh, here as well. But we got to talk about resistance because there's always people who are fighting for change here in the uh, in the United States. It's a couple more quick slides 
Um, and then if my daughter will let me continue, we will, I, I, I'll wrap it up and I'll open up. And I'm a little bit over, but we'll, 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 we'll keep going. So in 1865, we gotta, we have to keep also, we can't pretend, and we, we do this in Ohio a lot because my students do it all the time. You know, they say, well, you know, after 1865, after 1865, after slavery ends, then certainly, you know, so they, they, there's no racism, right? Like, oh, really? Well, that, that would be news to, to a lot of people after 1865 here in Ohio. There's two, two major legacies of slavery. One, African-Americans who are fighting no longer for a literal freedom from slavery, but they're fighting for uh, what I call their freedom rights, this combination of civil rights and human rights, as this ties into the resistance. As wherever you have had Black folk, you have Black folk fighting for freedom. And they haven't just been fighting for their freedom, right? This is where we often get mixed up and we say, oh, I don't want to talk about African-American history, that's just about Black folk. You got to understand, the freedom that Black folk were fighting for, trying to secure their basic civil rights and human rights, was also connected to this saving this democracy. Like, like fighting against white supremacy has been me has meant making this country more democratic for everybody. And so part of the twin legacies of uh, ending slavery in this post 1865 period is black folk fighting for freedom on the one hand, but then also white people fighting to maintain white supremacy. This is how you get Colfax. This is how you get Wilmington. That's part of that legacy coming out of the, the era of slavery. And it's not just in the South. It is very much uh, in the North as well, in places like Cincinnati, uh, in places uh, like Cleveland, where you have, in Springfield, where you will have these racial pogroms and massacres. And we have to deal with that reality as well. As we move forward through time and understand, so where do you begin? you got to begin early, but then you have to constantly see how this thread plays out over time. And one of the things that becomes clear and we need to talk about for sure, and those in New Albany have to talk about for sure as well, New Albany looks like New Albany does uh, for very particular reasons. It is structured in a particular way. Now, New Albany comes a little bit later down the road in the 1980s as a planned community, but it very much reflects the kind of structuring around society that is rooted in race. This is a map uh, of Columbus, Ohio, uh, from the late 19, from the mid 1930s, uh, that was part of uh, the 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 effort uh, to get America uh, on its knees again after the depression. And one of the ways to prime the pump, the federal government was going to prime the pump, uh, was to make mortgages available at reasonable rates to uh, ordinary citizens. Um, but they tell uh, banks that the only way that we're going to guarantee the mortgages that you loan the mortgages that you give is if you give them to white people living in all white neighborhoods. And so they come up with these maps and this is where redlining comes from. And if you zero, if we zoomed in on the map and you can find these online, you just gotta Google redlining maps. Uh, you can see that the neighborhoods in red are neighborhoods that are all African-American completely segregated. And they're also the neighborhoods that wouldn't get loans. The neighborhoods uh, uh, that were green, that were gold, these become the white neighborhoods. Bexley, you see over there, Upper Arlington over there as well. These are the neighborhoods that could receive the loans, that could, the home values there could then increase. And that's how you make the American middle class is rooted on these opportunities and loans, right? That the government affords. Now look, black folk then get excluded from this, not just in the 1930s, but all the, but for decades. So you're not really able to have black folk move into a place like Upper Arlington, for example, uh, here in central Ohio, not too far, until the 1970s, 1980s. Well, that's 40 years of wealth generation that a handful of black folk have moved out. And you do the same thing. You see some of the same processes, processes uh, at play in, uh, in New Albany and how that was structured, right? And you don't have to say, well, black folk, you don't have to write into a restrictive covenant like we see in some of these older urban center or er, er, uh, inner city uh, neighborhoods, uh, central core neighborhoods like Bexley and the like, where you have literally written into the deeds that black folk can't move in. Uh, but all you got to do is say, you know, you, you understand the uh, 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 wealth uh, differences and you just say, uh, you're not building any homes under 3,000 square feet, right? In a particular subdivision, a particular community. That right there is going to keep out uh, almost all the black folk who live in central Ohio, right? So th there's ways to structure our neighborhoods and housing become so critical because where you live determines the kind of access to opportunity that you have. 
the schools you go to, the hospitals that you go to. It's not a surprise that not only when we look at the current COVID crisis that people of color are being hurt the most, but even if you look at the neighborhoods that are being hurt, they're, uh, that are suffering the greatest devastation, uh, they're also neighborhoods of people of color because we still live in this segregated society. Now, this, this was coming out of the New Deal, but as we move forward, and this is the last, the last slide, and then, and then I'll open it up. Well, actually, I do want to say, I, I want to say one other thing. You know, it has to do with white privilege, right? Because there will be people who will say, look, I never, my parents were never able to get a loan as a white person, right? So how do I have white privilege? I'm just bad off. Like, yeah, yeah, they may not have been able to get a loan because they didn't have a job that gave them enough money to get a loan, but they weren't denied a loan just because they were white. They did not alone because they weren't able to tap into the privilege of whiteness. Like that's the difference. Like you can't blame black folk because you weren't able to tap into your whiteness. Like that ain't my fault, right? That's on you, right? You can't get mad at you. That's, there's, there's no guarantee that whiteness is gonna allow for your personal prosperity, right? Don't get mad at me because you're stuck in a mobile home. That wasn't my fault. That has broader implications of the economy. But what I'm saying is you weren't in that mobile home. Your Nana and Papa weren't in that mobile home uh, because of their race. That's something different. That's the difference between sort of privilege and advantage and those who are, are able to take advantage of it and those who never have that access or opportunity. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit later on. This last slide. So where do we go? Where does this all lead us to? How do we make sense of this moment when we need to be talking about race and racism because it's so, it, it so impacts and affects our, our lives? Uh, we saw most recently um, it, it seems like ages ago, but it was just the day before August 6th or, or January 6th uh, that we saw in Georgia, uh, Georgia flip from Republican to Democratic uh, with its this Senate runoff race with John Ossoff uh, and Senator Warnock uh, winning. You know, that is that is important uh, because, you know, we're coming up on the King holiday and Martin Luther King uh, used to love this quote. Uh, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, and many people look at that and say, you know, if we only give things time, change will, will happen. But time is not a social force. Time in and of itself is incapable of creating change. The only thing that happens with the passage of time is more of the same, or things get worse. If you allow things to slide and you don't engage it, you don't talk about it, you don't speak truth, then the arc of the moral universe will not bend towards justice, it will bend towards injustice. The only way that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice is if people exert a force to pull it in that direction. That's why we have to be talking about race and racism in American society. That's why we have to be talking about how it has influenced and led to the critical moment uh, that we find ourselves on where the democracy, the very, the very foundation of this nation uh, is in jeopardy and in peril. We saw, there is hope in this and we saw that uh, with, with what happened in Georgia, not because of the politics, but because of the rejection of a particular kind of politics, but also because people on the ground got engaged. They became engaged this grassroots effort. But the reality in America is, and, and, and I'll end it here, the reality in America is we've always been dealing with one of two options, the ballot or the bullet. Now, Malcolm X, civil rights activist coming out of New York uh, and Detroit and various other places in the Midwest, he does this famous speech, the ballot or the bullet, but the reality is that is American politics. And we gotta be aware of that that it's either going to be, if we don't commit to the ballot, to free and fair elections and to standing up for that, that we wind up with the bullet. And, and, this, and it's not separate from how we understand and talk about race and racism. People lost their lives um, in, in uh, uh, this past week. People also lost, uh, you know, Heather Heyer lost her life in Charlottesville. People lost their lives in Pittsburgh uh, at, at, at the uh, Tree of Life Synagogue, all because of the, of the racialization of politics 
based on lies. So when we're dealing with racism and we have to name it a little bit more specifically, we're talking about white supremacy in particular, wherever avowed white supremacists go, funerals follow. Wherever they go, funerals follow. And for those who are on this call who will listen to it later, if you think that this doesn't impact you and you're white, I'm just going to talk to my white friends for right now, right? If you're white and you're listening to this and you think, well, that's just, you know, unfortunate, this is something that black folk have to deal with, you know, they may be victims of it or such that, this, that, and the other. No. If you're a parent you and, you're, and you have a white child who is of high school age, of middle school age, you need to be worried about them being radicalized by white supremacy and them getting caught up in this because you have never talked to them about racism and white supremacy. You run the risk of losing your child to this fanaticism, to this racism, because you're either upholding a lie in silence or going along with a lie because you like the tax benefits. You need to make that decision. And the stakes just aren't about black folk anymore. They never were. They're also about your own children and your own and the future of this nation. Well, thank well, thank you very much. I'll stop there and stop sharing the screen. I have to unmute. Dr. Jeffries, thank you. That there was so much there to take in. Um, it was just very powerful, very personal. And I, I really appreciate how you ended it, you know, with just kind of coming back to some of those things that, you know, parents should do around their dinner table, right? One, sit around their dinner table. And two, have, have conversations, have these hard conversations and state your family values and how you want to bring your kids up and mm -hmm. go forth in the world to not, like you say, latch on to these white supremacist views and talk about what's happening. and. You know, and that's that's not the end all, of course. That, but that's just like one one step that can happen tomorrow, right? right. And then as we continue to move forward. So, I want to open before I open it up to our Zoom participants. I want to remind our YouTube audience that they can submit questions via email to Galloway one at naples .us. Um, And then I want to see if who has questions, who wants to start. Anyone, don't all jump out at once. Dr. Jeffries, hi, it's, it's, John, it's John Hood. Welcome back. So, Thank you, so, so thankful for you uh, sharing your time with us again tonight, especially with the conflict with OSU. So thanks for your, your dedication here. And, um, you know, especially as we look at the title of your presentation tonight, Making Sense of the Moment, and then this stuff that happens on January the 6th, where we sit and most of us, uh, in this session tonight, sit and think, I don't have a clue how I could make sense out of that moment. Mm. That moment makes no sense to me, mm -hmm. you know, that something like that would happen. How, can you give us a little bit more, um, you know, you just had this sort of powerful ending here saying we need to be talking to our children, yeah. you know, and we need to be having these hard history kind of moment conversations. Can you give us a, whatever other guidance you can give related to that in terms of how do I meaningfully engage my kids in conversation when this craziness is happening on the news and trying to make sense of it. Well, let's just take it in a, in a, in a, uh, in a narrow time frame, right? We don't have to go all the way back to 1619 at the very first dinner conversation, right? We can just go back to early November, 2020, um, just, just three months ago. It seems like ages ago, it was only three months ago, right? We can go back then in the moment in which the president of the United States, literally the night of the election comes out and leading up to it, had been priming the pump, saying that the election had been stolen, the election was fraudulent. That was the moment to sit down and talk to your children and say, this is not true. There is no evidence whatsoever, not one shred of evidence. And you don't, want, you don't have to take my word for it as a parent. You can look at all of the courts and, that, and judges some 30, 40, 50 cases uh, that in which no evidence was presented, no judge uh, worth their salt, no judge at all said that there was any merit to these allegations of fraud. That is the beginning in this particular moment that results in what we saw on January 6th. Why? Because of the steady 
drumbeat that this how this somehow was a fraudulent election. Others going coming from one person, right? But others going along with it for whatever their reasons were, either in silence by not saying anything, not coming out and saying, no, this is not true, or those saying, well, I think we this has some credibility, we should investigate. I mean, that's just that's giving it merit, giving it fuel. It was a lie. Right? This not a, that's not about politics. It just wasn't true. And that and, and that's you know, we have to talk to our kids about truth, fantasy, and reality. Because if the the, the risk here in the perpetuation of this lie particularly as it relates to politics. I mean, you know, lies are dangerous in all these other ways, but particularly as it relates to politics, is that what, they're, what he was saying, what the president of the United States was saying, was that this election was illegitimate. And if the election is illegitimate, then those who are taking office are illegitimate as well. And we live in a society, we live in a nation where our founding documents say the people have a right, duty, and obligation to remove those who are illegitimate in office. So you are essentially giving permission to people based upon a lie to use force, violence, and whatever means necessary to undermine the democracy. That's how we make sense of this. Like, how did we get here where you have armed people storming the Capitol? in the name of, of, of trying to maintain white supremacy. It has everything to do with the lie, a lie from one person, but a lie that was allowed to fester. And it did not take long, partly because we live in this social media uh, vacuum in which, which information is able just, just to, to, to be disseminated at light speed. That's why it's so critical that we all use our voices to speak truth. Like we all can do that as teachers and as parents, like we are duty bound to do that to our children. And if we don't know, if we're skeptical ourselves or we just don't have the information because we're not as tuned in, then we have to go find it out. We can't leave it to our children because, because they have access in many ways to this misinformation and disinformation as well. Like the greatest threat to democracy right now is white supremacy. And white supremacists also understand that democracy is the greatest threat to white supremacy. That's why they're going after it. But it all stemmed from a lie. And that's why it's so important that we always try to uplift, spotlight, and speak truth, even when we may disagree with what that truth is. Thank you. I really appreciate those words, uh, especially uh, these guys will roll their eyes when I say this because I say this so much around here, but we've got this commitment that we sort of uh, understand that we have the capability of speaking kids into existence. The things we say to them, the truth that we speak to them are who they become. And I was watching those events on the 6th and I'm seeing QAnon shirts okay. and I'm seeing uh, people who have been spoken into existence through some other, some other whole other thing. And so I think what you just described for me is just so critically important is that those conversations that we have at our dinner table in just these really genuine ways are just based in truth and, and just talking to our kids about who we want them to become yeah. because they're going to follow us. They're going to follow our words. So I, I really, I really appreciate that. I know Diane, I'll let you need lead. I know you want others. To be no, you're gonna, yeah. But I see that DP has her hand raised. Yeah, that's Dr. Jeffress, thanks, Diane. Thanks for your time, Dr. Jeffress, to come and talk about uh, the racism and all the things that are going on currently. Uh, my question may be slightly unique. You've talked so much about the history of African-American and Black community in this country. I belong, I'm an Indian by origin, so I have, a, uh, you know, essentially a brown uh, descent. Uh, I, I always wonder where and how uh, do my kids and me fit into all this? It's hard sometimes to kind of have that history to help everybody understand where we're coming from. And there is all, you know, we talk about white supremacy and I, I can tell you a lot of Indian, mm -hmm. Indian descent people also have, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, 
few of them they do have that allegiance to white supremacy yeah. so uh, you know sometimes i wonder how to raise that conversation and have that conversation uh, being a brown and really not uh, uh not belonging to either groups what yeah. what would your suggestion uh, be for the brown community to fit well in the society and not be part of this racism Yeah, no, thank you so much for that question because it's an important one and one we need to talk about. Um, and I, I, I answer it to, with, with two quick, short, quick answers. Actually, it won't be short and it won't be quick because nothing I say is short and quick. The one is that white, white supremacy is global, right? The, the ideology of white supremacy is not something that is confined just to the United States. It is global. It exists not just in majority white nations, European nations. It exists also in uh, nations of color. Uh, it, it is a global phenomenon. You can go to a place like Brazil, and in Brazil, the largest uh, nation of people of African descent outside the continent of Africa, uh, and you look at the socioeconomic breakdown and the people who are more phenotypically African are at the bottom of almost every statistic, and the people who are more phenotypically European are at the top, right? I mean, white supremacy mm -hmm. is a global phenomenon. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is in the American context in particular, race and how it is understood uh, is still, uh, or, or was, was, based in, was based in large measure on this black-white dichotomy. And that's why it's so important to understand sort of America through the prism of the black experience, because that, has then, that then informs and influences how all other people of color are then treated in the American context in one way, in one shape or another. So mm -hmm. if you are a person of color, whether you're coming, you're South Asian or not, when you come over here, right, when, when you're here or even however long you've been born here, you're still going to be treated in a, in, a, in a sense in that initial interaction uh, through beliefs that have been filtered through this prism of white supremacy based upon this black white experience and black white paradigm. Now, it may not be exactly the same. It won't be exactly the same. There will be these other stereotypes that will be uh, foisted on to people dependent upon where they're coming from. If they're coming from the continent of Africa, if they're Nigerian, mm -hmm. or they're coming from Latin America, or if they're coming from so uh, Southeast Asia, like it, the, it, there will be this nuance. But the, the, the thread uh, is still this idea of somehow, if you are a person of color, you are less than. Mm -hmm unless and until you're able to distinguish yourself as an individual separate from the group. And that has its own problems and, 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 and dangers as well, right? Because that's reflective of this idea of uh, racial hierarchy. And so I, I, I say all that to say, the experience will be different, um, but the experience is informed by this longer history of race that is based upon this black white paradigm. And the only group, the only people who are truly able to escape that uh, in America, even to this day, especially if they are immigrants, right, depending upon how, lo how long that, that people have been here, mm -hmm. is people who come directly from Europe, are, 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 who come directly from Europe, Europe. And then over the generations, they're able to blend into this whiteness. Like the, the people who get dropped in the melting pot who only melt are white folk, right? People from mm -hmm. Europe. Everybody else, you know, they pretty much who they are. They in the stew, right? They just being swirled around. So, you know, unless you're going to eventually, uh, you know, literally phenotypically move in that way, then you're always going to have to deal with, certainly into the immediate future, with these assumptions of who you are based upon your 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 perceived nation of origin. Even if you're even if you're born here, right? The perceived ancestral link, as well as how people understand other people based upon race. So the, the, there is no solution to it other than engaging in education and informing and talk. But the reality is you got to deal with it. And that's mm -hmm. why the notion of sort of solidarity of people in color is so very important because we're all going to deal with these issues in, at some point, uh, not because of who we are individually, but because who we are perceived to be in terms of the group that we belong to. Thank you. Appreciate your response. Thank you. Okay. Aaron, I had seen that you have your hand up next and then um, Denise, you're after her. Thank you. Um, hi, I, so I teach eighth grade social studies, which is American history from colonialism to reconstruction in US government. So all the fun stuff we've been discussing. Um, and I guess I had more of a comment than a question that 
I really appreciate you mentioning and reminding to talk at home with kids because while I'm watching the Capitol City riots and every other socialist teacher in the country is, is what are we gonna say tomorrow? What are we gonna say tomorrow to our students? Because they're watching and they have questions. And sometimes I think families, sometimes think kids can't handle it and they can. And the more of the conversations we can have at home, the better because that wasn't the first night where I thought, what am I gonna say tomorrow in the classroom? Because it's happened way too often as of late. And, it's, and it is the hard history that needs to be talked about, not only in my classroom, but at home at the dinner table. Um, so I just want to echo, I really appreciate that as a teacher, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. that, that helps me do my job better. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, it's true, because as teachers, we all do that. Okay, how are we going to approach this, and what's going to be on top of mind of students? But that's also why we have to, that going back to John's question, like how do we make sense of what we just saw, you know, and knowing that one of the things that we do is we come up with these, you know, false narratives. If, if we didn't talk about Black Lives Matter and what those protests were about, and then you didn't talk about it with your kids. We didn't talk about it in the classroom. And then something like this happens. And then they hear the spin. Well, that's just because of Black Lives Matter. Right now. Now, like they have nothing to push back on right? because they weren't a part of that conversation. And you're absolutely right. This isn't just something that we need to reserve for students who are in the eighth grade. And we need to be talking about our, talking about these issues to our children, uh, just as we talk about anything else. Right. They can. Like we're the ones who are nervous when it comes to talking about race. Like that's a that's a us issue, right? That's a, that's a that's a you know that's a parental issue. That's an adult issue. Kids will talk about anything. Like y'all know that, right? Your kids will talk about anything, right? This is you. Like oh, nah, 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 that, that's okay. We'll come back. We'll go talk to your mama, right? I mean that's us. But we got to get over. We have to get over our own anxiety, right? In part because we have our own complexes, right? For different reasons. If you're if you're if you're a person of color. Right. I, I totally get with three daughters of my own, like wanting to extend that bubble of protection around. How long can I shield them from the ill effects of racism in this world? Like, I get that. But the reality is we can't. Like, they, they, we have to we have to inoculate them. Like talking about racism with children of color is really the inoculation. But talking about racism with white children is the same thing. Because if you don't inoculate them from these beliefs in white supremacy, they're going to wind up being radicalized and believing this foolishness. And that's not what you want either. And so it, we really have to have these difficult conversations, as you were saying, Aaron. We got to have them early and we got to have them consistently. Right. We just can't be like, OK, we talked about that. Right. We watched the Sesame Street show. We're done. Like, no, you got to reinforce. What are you thinking? How is this conversation going? Do you have questions? And then I think, let me just add this for teachers as well. You know, what do you do when the kids come in and they start talking crazy, right? Like, and they're spouting, right? The QAnon stuff in this instance, right? They're spouting like, well, no, you know, the, the, it, the, the election was rigged and all that stuff. And then whatever you do, whatever you say, not going to take your word for it, right? My fallback is, okay, if that's what you believe, what is your evidence, right? As a historian, I always come back to, well, give me your evidence. In fact, I'll give you extra credit for it, right? <laughs> go, go give, make your argument for me, right? Like, I'm not gonna sit here and debate with you, right? Go make your argument for me and come back with substantial and credible evidence. Convince me of your position. Well, that's now, 100% I what I say. The challenge, I think, Teacher too, is we, we walk a very fine line, right? A, I'm not gonna bring in my bias, but there's a collective agreement that racism is not okay. Homophobia right. is not okay. Like that's an opinion that that's needs to be stopped. But I also, you know, have a lot of like, well, my parents said this at the dinner table. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, find evidence. <laughs> also not accurate. I don't tell you, like that's not what's happening. Yeah. So it is, it's been a real um, real hard year. Not gonna lie, as a socialist yeah. teacher, all teachers, but uh, <laughs> Yeah. for social studies. So yes, just, so thank and, you for supporting. Yeah, no, for sure. And, 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 and not just for teachers, but I think for all of us, right? Like why do we, especially for, especially for our, our, white, our white friends and colleagues, like why do we sort of resist this? Why do we resist having these conversations? You know, why do we, you know, why is this so hard? This is the thing, like white supremacy is something in white people's heads, right? Like it, that's, it's, 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 it ain't a black thing. Like black people are like, we're okay. Like we can do away with white supremacy. We'll be good. This is something that white people, like why is it so hard to let go of white, these white supremacist beliefs? 
Hold on a second. Why is it so hard? Part of that answer is not only that, well, it, it, it has informed the way we see the world, but it has also informed the way we see those we love around us, right? Like our parents, our grandparents, those things that they have said that have been so deeply invested in racism and white supremacy. If you're asking me to reject that, if you're asking a child in the classroom to believe in facts, right? And they're offering, and, and what, they're, what they're hearing at home is something counter to that. Then the question, but you're asking them to go against, in, in essence, their parents, those who they love. And what does that mean? Like that is, that's a challenge. And that's why I'm saying they often reject it. Go find, go give me some facts. You go do the homework, right? Don't put it on me. You go do it and see what you come and see what you come up with. Dr. Jeffries, I think you need to do an introduction before we move on to the next yes. question. Yes. Yeah. Are you going to say, okay, so this is my youngest daughter. This is Alayla. You're going to say, hey. hey. Okay, what, what do you need? <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Okay, um, okay yeah, Denise, thank you, Aaron. Thank you for sharing your viewpoint. I think it's really important for all of us, to our parents, to hear that. Um, Denise, you have a question? Well, Layla just kind of helped me with my question because um, I'm an educator in a preschool kindergarten building, and the events of the past week are really heavy. And so, as in, in our building, you know, we teach, we celebrate everyone's difference, no matter what the difference is, but how do we, you know, teach these lessons or have these conversations with our youngest learners? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. And I think it, I think the answer to is, the answer to the question is we don't wait, right? Like we don't wait to this moment when they're hearing these things and decide, okay, now is the time to have this conversation. We have to be talking about these issues very early on. Alayla, I was talking to her older, her, uh, she, uh, my, I have three girls and the oldest one who is 10. And, you know, we're watching this stuff. They, they know, you know, Uncle Hakeem is in Congress and all this other stuff. And so my 10 year old got very much is of that age in the fifth grade is very much into, um, you know, politics now. And, and so she came down on, you know, on, on that Wednesday and she, or the other day and she, was, and she says, she says, daddy, you know, Trump got impeached. And Alayla, who's sitting off in the corner, she said, again, right? And then added with, well, what did he do this time, right? And so, and so she's, you know, she's hearing these things, right? I mean, we talk about it and she overhears the parent, you know, uh, my, myself and my wife, we're talking about these things, right? So it's not like um, they're in vacuums. So we, the, the, what we have to do is, not treat them like adults. All conversations have to be age appropriate, but we need to talk to them about fairness, about discrimination, about inequality, about racism, about prejudice. You know, preschoolers get this, right? Like pre preschoolers take something away from a preschooler and who they feel and they feel aggrieved. Like they will let you know. Right. I mean, so if they understand, they understand that intuitively, then why aren't we building lesson plans around that? Right. That that both connect to historical realities, but then that also very much connect to these notions of what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is a lie, what is fair and what is unfair. Now, imagine when we get if we're doing that, Miss Johnson, in, in, in kindergarten, by the time we get to Miss Farley's class. Right. These kids are like, oh, yeah, let's talk about America. Let's talk about the Constitution. Right. Let, let, let's talk about sort of slavery and 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 sort of these truths and hard truths. They'll have a much easier time dealing with it then if we were planning. Right. To set that up by having these conversations early on. And these aren't sort of judgment calls. Right. I mean, it is, you know, some stuff is just right and some stuff is wrong. Period. Like lynching is not right. At a certain point, we need to talk to our kids about that. I'm not saying we do it in preschool, but my God, I shouldn't be having students coming from New Albany to Ohio State and they didn't know lynching occurred in America. What, 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 that can't be. So at a certain point, we got to think about how we're going to, uh, when and how we're going to address these difficult subjects, but we, got, we can't wait too long. We got to build that foundation, right? Um, always going, you know, at, from, from the earliest. Uh, uh, um, for our earliest learners. 
Well, I thank you because I this is my third time hearing you speak and I learned something new every time I hear you. So thank you so very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Diane, I have a few that have uh, come in through email. That's perfect. Okay. Um, this one kind of, it's been touched upon a little bit, but it's basically going to how do we give teachers the license to teach the hard history? Mm. And the fact that, um, this is a little long, so I apologize. Teachers inevitably face pushback from some of the families they serve under the guise that this information is not part of state standards. Um, it seems as though we need, we need some sort of state standards specifically formatted to lay out a scope and sequence for the material that needs to be covered starting kindergarten through high school. Mm -hmm. So the gist of it is how can we develop protections as teachers for ourselves without that support of the state education leadership yeah. uh, in order to be comfortable teaching the truth in our classrooms? Yeah, well, well the, the questioner will be uh, happy to know that the State Board of Education is very much working right now uh, on reviewing its state standards and coming up with something that is more reflective um, of uh, the hard history and how to challenge and take on these difficult subjects. It won't be ready immediately. I've been in conversations with some, with some of the folk who are involved with that. Um, so that's, that's in the offing. But I think in the end, the protection won't come from state standards. One, you got to do it, right? You, you have to be able to teach the truth. To do anything else is to commit educational malpractice, right? Like we as educators have to teach the truth. Can you imagine if, if, if math teachers did to math what we do to American history? It wouldn't be allowed to they have their licenses revoked, right? It was like, ah, we're just not going to deal with addition. It's just a little difficult, right? Like, what are you talking, right? Like, like you only, only, we can only do that in social studies in American history, right? Get away with it. So we have to stop doing that. It, it is incumbent. Our charge is to teach, is to teach the truth, uh, you know, how, in, in, its, in its various forms and fashions. And if we don't do that, then, then we're not doing our job. But I think the real protection won't come from, or, or, or the real protection for, for teachers is not in the state standards. The real protection has to come from administration. Like, like that's, that's who has to create the space for our teachers to do what we're supposed to do. Like why we've committed our lives to doing this stuff. Like I, I mean, last time I checked, even me as a college professor, ain't none of us millionaires. Like we don't go into this stuff to get rich. We go into because we love education, we love teaching, and we don't want to be hamstrung because we're afraid of what some parent says. Right? We want parents involved in the conversation, but they don't, we don't want them in the way. Right? Do, let us do what we do. We, spend a, we got a lot of student loans to pay off, right? To get this, we know what we're talking about, let's do it. But administrators, our administrators, the school board on down to the, to the leadership in our buildings, they're the ones who have to create the space. Like in an ideal world, they're the ones that are like, no, 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 this is our commitment. These are our teachers. We hire the best. We got the best and the brightest. They're doing what is right. They're going to teach our kids the truth, right? They're going to be better students for it. Let them do what they do, right? That is really, in the, you know, we need, our, we need our principals and assistant principals to have our backs as teachers to do that. That's where the space comes from in the ideal world. Now, short of that, I think individually, we just have to, we got to, we got to press on and try to create our space, make our voices heard, involve parents, right? So they know what's going on from the very beginning, right? Like, look, beginning of the semester, this is what I'm teaching. This is why we're teaching it. This is where we're starting. This is where we're going. So you provide information to combat some of the disinformation. Now, look, there's always going to be, there's always going to be parents, right? There's, you know, who are, you know, just because we're in this moment, right? We're in a, if you call it post-truth, whatever it is, we're in a moment where no matter what you say, no matter what you share, people are going to push back on it. And it's like, you know, okay, but I got to do what I have to do, right? You may not like the medical procedure, but what are you going to tell the doctor to stop, right? Like that doesn't, like, no, I got to follow the practice of the same, we have to do the same thing, right? We have to be committed to it and have to do it, but we need help. And that's the plea to the administ administrators, we got to have help. Yeah, I have another one that's sort of related to that. <laughs> uh, and I don't, you will not have the answer to this, I believe, but I think that should be stated. Um, and it is from a staff member. Um, what kinds of support should New Albany teachers expect 
from our Board of Education and Administration, mm -hmm. the folks that brought you here to speak with us, for teachers to state the obvious truth in the face of the big lie. So I just wanted to put that one out there. Yeah, it's the, you know, there are, there are moments where we need, and this isn't just New Albany, this is all school districts, this is all colleges and universities, Ohio State was just on a call with the President of the United States, uh, President of the United States, just on a call with the President of Ohio State. And it's like, we need those statements, right? We, it, it's silence in this moment is unacceptable. Even when people may not be asking the question, right, directly of our, uh, of our school boards and our administrators and our you know, principals and leadership, it's still incumbent that we state our case, we state the position, because that creates the space. And I, I, think, I think especially, especially we saw what silence does. We saw what silence does. Silence costs people their lives. Silence may cost us our democracy. So where do we want to stand? There's an old civil rights song um, that came out of the freedom movement. It was called, Which Side Are You On? And the civil rights activists, as they were marching, they, 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 they would be singing, which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? Right? And, and, and we, we, it, it, this is the, these are one of those times where our leadership has to state unequivocally which side they are on. And it shouldn't be hard. We're talking about the truth versus a clear lie. It's not even complicated. Right? We should be able to stand up. Our, our, our leadership should be able to stand up and say, no, we are going to talk about this and we're going to talk about the truth. And our teachers who are talking specifically about it have our permission to do it. And not only we need them to do it so we don't perpetuate the lie going forward and delegitimize our government. Wow, well, that, that's a, a great. Great, great ending. Great way to wrap up our evening. Powerful statement. Um, Dr. Jeffries, thank you. Thank you for making this time on your very busy evening for us. Thank you to everybody on the Zoom call for engaging in these conversations. Thank you to all in YouTube world watching and listening and sending in your questions. We look forward to having you back again with us, Dr. Jeffries, February 11th. A little bit more spe talking specifically to children, do's and don'ts of talking to children. Thank you and everybody have a great night. Thanks a lot, everyone. Good evening.